So today I am going to speak to you all about uh, essentially my top tips for feeding and, and some management tips for feeding and managing uh, horses with metabolic and endocrine disorders. So I've, I've kind of lumped it into six tips that we'll, we'll walk through together here. But before we get started on the actual tips, I thought, a, I thought it might be a good place to start to just talk about the prevalence of easy keepers. Now, not every horse we're going to be discussing today is an easy keeper. However, statistically, we now know that about half of horses and ponies are either overweight or obese. So I just had a feeling that a lot of you folks coming to the breakout session today might be joining us because you have an easy keeper in your program. And um, in addition to my, my professional expertise in equine nutrition, I am the owner of a rather easy keeper. This is my Lippet Morgan, old type Morgan here, who on the, the image on the left, you can see him at in sort of his chunkier phase and the image on the right a little bit fitter, a little bit leaner, but I just thought it was a nice place to start to say, I, if you've got an easy keeper, I feel your pain. I'm constantly managing this particular horse, trying to keep him as lean as possible because he's certainly at risk for equine metabolic syndrome, and I, of course, want to avoid that. Um, so let's jump into the, the actual tips themselves. Where I wanted to start was talking about you know, just some basic education and where I recommend you folks start. I think it's really important to understand at least the, the fundamental differences between equine metabolic syndrome and um, Cushing's disease, which more accurately these days is called pituitary pars intermedia dysfunction, or PPID. And um, in addition to understanding those differences, which we're going to walk through briefly on the next slide, um, it's imperative to work closely with your veterinarian to make sure you get an accurate diagnosis, first and foremost and then also to design a, a treatment and a management plan for, for that individual horse going forward. Um, and I kind of lumped in body condition scoring to this first tip as well, so we'll walk through that, what that means in a couple of slides. But first let's take a look at some, some of the visual and um, written differences between EMS and PPID. So um, these illustrations come from Smart Pack, and I think they do a great job showing you know, just sort of the across the fence view of what a horse might look like with one of these conditions. So let's start with equine metabolic syndrome. Generally speaking, this condition occurs in middle-aged horses. So um, we're gonna get to Cushing's in a second, but in the back of your mind, remember that Cushing's is typically more of a senior horse disease. So the, the equine metabolic horse, typically these, these signs and problems are gonna start to crop up you know, it's not a set age, but somewhere between age 6, 8, 10, that's, that's often when you're going to start see, seeing some of these issues crop up. Um, this, is, this is a disorder that is highly associated with obesity and, and overweight horses, but probably more important to look out for is um, abnormal fatty deposits, which your veterinarian might refer to as regional adiposity. Adipose tissue is fat, so it really just means weird fat blobs in places there shouldn't be, right? And it's not really even normal body fat. It's metabolically active fat, which can create, you know, sort of a cascade of, of further problems down the road if you don't get it in check. So we're talking about a crusty neck. Um, that's the most common one, I would think. Um, fat above the tail head, which you can kind of see in the illustration there. Shoulder pads, sometimes even the sheath of geldings. Um, the, above the eye sockets, oddly enough, can become kind of puffy with fat where they would normally be like a little bit of a divot. So um, you really, you know, over obese and overweight horses for sure, we're keeping an eye on. But technically speaking, you could have a horse whose overall body condition was, was relatively normal, but then they develop a crusty neck or some of these other fatty deposits, and that's definitely something to look out for. Um, the other, besides this regional adiposity, the other, you know, sort of cornerstones of this of this health condition are insulin resistance, or or more broadly, this is now also being referred to as insulin dysregulation, and then ultimately laminitis. So, if these horses aren't managed properly, they develop these fatty deposits, they develop insulin resistance. Um, eventually, you know, it's very likely that they they they're at high risk for laminitis. So, those are the sort of three pillars of this health disorder. Um, we already mentioned middle-aged horses. It's definitely more common in certain breeds. Um, again, it's not like a 
set standard list. It could happen in any horse, but any of these breeds that are what we would call a, you know, a hardier breed type, so your ponies, I already mentioned my own horse as a Morgan is very predisposed to this. Um, you know, sometimes gated horses, this, this lists Arabians and warm bloods of, of, various, um, of various breeds. One that's missing from here are Mustangs, are also really predisposed. Domesticated Spanish Mustangs are, um, you know, when they're not wandering the plains eating tumbleweeds when they're locked in a stall and being fed grain, they get fat extremely easily and are predisposed to this. Um, so yeah, that's that's EMS in a nutshell, and I'm I'm going kind of fast because I want to make sure we leave time for the rest of the tips. But this is a good place to start. And then moving over to the Cushing's horse or the PPID horse, um, some of the things that jump out visually are probably the horse's hair coat and maybe his top line and his and his belly. So um, first of all, what is Cushing's? It's it's basically a dysfunctioning pituitary gland. Um, there is going to be overproduction of, of certain hormones that are produced by the pituitary gland, and um, a whole cascade of events happen as a result of that, that pituitary dysfunction. Um, one of the things that, or several of the things that occur are muscle wasting, so loss of top, top, top line, and, and also loss of abdominal muscle. So oftentimes we hear folks say like, oh, my Cushing's horse has a hay belly. I think he's too fat. But honestly, what, what could be going on is that, if, especially if you see the horse is losing top line, muscle wasting is relatively common with this disease. And horses, in addition to their top line muscle, they will lose abdominal muscle tone. And horses' intestines are very heavy. heavy. So their belly starts to hang down. They get sort of this pendulous abdomen because their ab muscles aren't holding their intestines up in the body cavity as well anymore. So it's not really the horse getting fat necessarily. That's something to, to chat with your veterinarian about to, to be sure about, but that's, that's a common issue. And definitely let's talk about this shaggy hair coat. You might hear it called hirsutism. You might also hear this called hypertrichosis. Um, you know, either of those terms are, are considered okay to use. But in a nutshell, these horses are not um, shedding normally, especially you know in the springtime when seasonally they should be shedding. They're going to hang on to that hair coat and they're going to have a long, shaggy hair coat. Often they will require body clipping multiple times a year. So um, you know it, it it doesn't. Horses could develop this this abnormal shedding you know earlier in the disease process or or further down the line. Um, that's why again working closely with your vet to to get diagnosis early is going to help you hopefully catch and manage some of these things. But that shaggy hair coat is also a classic um, issue with the Cushing's horse. And then some of the other things are um, a, a poor immune function. A lot of times these horses, if not, if not managed properly, will pr be prone to hoof abscesses or um, they're, they won't have normal wound healing. So they'll, a, a little cut or scrape that normally would heal pretty easily, they'll have a harder time with that. And, you know, speaking, oversimplifying, essentially, you know, these um, imbalanced hormonal issues that are going on are um, causing their immune system to not be um, up to par, and so you can see some of these secondary issues as a result. Again, this is a super quick overview of the issues. Um, the, the Cushing's horse most likely needs to be managed with prescription medication. The, the FDA-approved drug is called Percent, but those are all, you know, understanding what's going on with your individual horse and, and how to manage it are definitely questions for your veterinarian. I just wanted to give us a brief starting point to make sure everybody kind of understands when I refer to the EMS horse versus the Cushing's or PPID horse. So moving on to the next slide, I also just wanted to do a quick overview of body condition scoring. If you don't already know how to do this, um, I would highly recommend learning. It's really simple, um, something your vet can teach you or something, there's some great resources on, on YouTube, there's some good videos to learn how to do this. But basically this gives, um, this is how veterinarians are trained to evaluate a horse's fat cover and it, it helps veterinarians have this standardized objective view of you know how um, thin or fat a horse is.
So, because we all know, like, one person's background, they might, you know, aesthetically, they might like a horse to carry a little bit more weight than another person. But what we're trying to say is, from a health perspective and from an objective perspective, how much fat cover is this horse carrying? So, so basically, you, you score the horse in the six areas of the body. It's a visual evaluation, and physically, you need to put your hands on and feel that area of the body. And you give each of those six areas of the body a score from one to five, one being extremely emaciated and nine being extremely obese. Um, and, and most horses, a five is ideal. I say most horses because you might have a racehorse or, you know, let's say an advanced level event horse who is purposely managed on the leaner side, like a four, four and a half. You might have a broodmare who is purposely managed more at like a six because she's um, preparing for um, – you know, foaling and lactation when she's going to lose a lot of weight. So, but for most horses, you're working towards a five in the middle there. So again, your vet could teach you how to do this, but as we go through the rest of these tips, I'm going to, you know, mention body condition scoring here and there. And I think it's a great practice to do with your horses regularly. All right. So let's move on to tip number two. Regardless of the type of horse you're managing, you know, fundamentally all horses need about one to 2% of their body weight in forage per day. Um, I always say forage should be the foundation of every horse's diet. Now that might have to take different forms depending on what's going on with your individual horse, where you live in the country, and you know, what type of forage you have access to. But um, of their, the horse's body weight. So if we, you know, if we have a thousand pound horse, that's 10 to 20 pounds of, of some combination of roughage per day. It might be a combination of pasture plus hay plus some of the other things we're going to get into. It might be all hay. So I kind of broke down some of the things to keep in mind for the, the equine metabolic syndrome horse versus the PPID horse. So let's walk through this. For the EMS horses, in terms of pasture, ideally, we're going to be trying to avoid this if at all possible. Um, the fresh green pasture has a lot of sugar, and in particular, there's a particularly risky type of sugar called fructans that are um, definitely, you know, increasing these horses' risk of developing laminitis. So, you know, I, I say ideally because I, you know, of course I understand if if the only turnout available you you have available is grass pasture. We can't lock the horses in the stall. They need to get out. They need to move. That's paramount for a variety of other health reasons. Um, but so, so if you have a horse, if if you have one of these types of horses, but pasture turnout is your only option, I highly recommend a grazing muzzle. Um, there's a picture of um, horse, some horses wearing grazing muzzles there. One, the one on the left with the star is my horse. He's not so thrilled with wearing it, but now I have him on a dry lot, so he doesn't have to. But at that particular barn, I didn't have a lot of options. So, um, you know, I encourage you to check out different styles of grazing muzzles. Some are a better fit than others. Make sure the horse can breathe okay, drink, you know, drink water. Some of them, if they've never worn it before, you have to kind of, you know, don't turn them out all day for the first time. Let them get used to it. You know, put some treats in it so they get used to eating through the bottom and, and they can figure that out and, and make it a pleasant experience when you first put it on. Um, moving on to the next tip. One thing you could think about if it's an option for you and your and your staff or whoever's caring for the horses is is maybe turning the horses out overnight if you have to have a grass pasture. The reason for this is um, the sugars are actually highest in the grass during the day when the sun is out, and then those plants are using up their sugar stores overnight. I believe it's 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. is technically when the, the sugars are going to be the lowest. You know, not the most convenient thing, but I thought that was worth worth mentioning. I also really encourage folks to seek pasture management expertise, whether it's you know your local extension agency or there's a reference at the back of the book called uh, excuse me at the back of my deck um, safergrass.org. So you'll see that that website at the end of the slides here. Um, that's a really great resource for pasture management for horses. But you know some things to think about that they might be able to advise you if you have these easy keeper horses that are sensitive to sugars. Um, Mowing your pastures might not be the best thing. It may be better to let them be a little stemmier and a little weedier so that they have, well, I should be careful saying weeds. We obviously want to avoid toxic plants, but stemmier, older grasses that have more fiber versus the little sweet, sugary baby grasses might be a better option. So that's something you could ask those pasture experts about. Also, I learned that 
sometimes in drought conditions when the grasses are really stressed and they just look brown and dead, they can actually spike in sugar depending on the stress level of the grass. So that's something to, to think about. And, and lastly here, um, you know, I feel like folks often know that sugar spike in the grasses during the springtime, but don't realize that that happens again in the fall. So sometimes there can be a little rash of laminitis cases in the fall, just like often happens in the spring, um, and that may be related to the, to the sugars in your pasture. So being careful about all of those things is, is, is an important thing. Moving on to the hay. Um, I have here seeking out low NSC. NSC stands for non-structural carbohydrates. So you have the structural part of a plant that gives you know, stems their uh, rigidity. Um, those are the, the fibrous parts of a plant that are actually imperative for horses to have. That's that roughage part, that 1% to 2% of the body weight needs to come from roughage. We're talking here about the non-structural carbohydrates, meaning the sugars and the starches of a plant. So um, I don't like folks to get too focused on the numbers here, but you could work with um, someone who offers hay analysis to, to figure out what, you know, what a good benchmark is. Um, we're going to talk about grains in a second, but in a grain you, you would seek 10% or lower non-structural carbohydrates. Um, sometimes you, know, you only have access to one kind of hay, so I understand you have to kind of work with what you got. But um, you know, if it's possible for you to do hay analysis and understand how sugary your hay is and, and recognizing that first to second cut from the same field could be quite different, um, that's something to think about. Um, a great little tool though is if you can't control where your hay comes from or you can't do hay analysis, you could think about soaking your hay. Um, the rule of thumb here is, and this is different from wetting the hay, Just spray, we're not talking about just spraying down the hay to get the dust out for respiratory conditions. Um, we're talking about actually, you know, getting a clean new muck bucket or, or something like that and soaking the hay. 30 minutes if you have warm water in the barn, 60 minutes if you have cold water. You don't want to leave it in longer than that because then you're going to start to leach some of the good nutrients. And you do want to dump that water because you've essentially created sugar water. But that is a really effective way to reduce some of the sugar content from your hay. And then lastly, also, I'm a huge fan of, you know, these slow feeder hay bags, hay nets. There's a ton of great options available on the market now. Um, not only are they going to slow down, make the hay last longer. So if you have a horse like mine, who if I gave him his serving of hay, it would be, you know, on the ground, it would be gone in 15 minutes. I swear these easy keeper types are the fastest eaters on the planet, right? So um, it slows him down. It makes that hay last longer. So he's kind of like nibbling and mimicking um, that sort of natural grazing behavior that's fabulous for the digestive system, keeps him mentally occupied longer throughout the day, and you waste less hay, which is a good thing considering how expensive hay is. Moving on to the, the Cushing's horses, the PPID horses, um, a lot of the stuff above does apply, but I, I, you know, they fundamentally still need to have the, the foundation of their diet come from the same way. But, you know, if, if we have older horses that, um, especially if they're having issues with their weight or, or dental problems, you may have to get a little bit more creative in meeting that 1% to 2%. So, for example, you know, say your horse, um, your, your senior Cushing's horse was still able to eat hay, but you notice he's starting to have a little bit of that quitting occur. Quitting is when they get those balls of wet um, forage falling out of their mouth because of their, their dental status, um, you could introduce something like beet pulp. Beet pulp is a fabulous source of, of very digestible fiber that's easy for the horse to chew, especially if it's you know soaked beet pulp. Um, it's very low in sugar because it's actually the byproduct of, of the, the sugar beet production after they've removed the sugar. It's essentially just the fibrous part left over. The one caveat here is make sure you ask your feed store for non-molasses beet pulp because sometimes they add molasses in for flavoring and if our goal is to watch out for sugars we don't want that. Um, and there's you know there's a variety of other um, forage options in terms of you know hay cubes or alfalfa cubes, chopped forages, things of that nature. Um, you know with the Cushing's horse sometimes it's a little bit more challenging to determine how risky the, sh the sugars are for the Cushing's horse versus the EMS horse so that's a great opportunity to have a conversation with your veterinarian. However, when in doubt, I would say the more you can manage the Cushing's horse 
as if he's as if the sugars are risky for him too, um, the better. Because what I forgot to say on the previous slide where we were talking about the differences between those two conditions is that the Cushing's um, or the PPID horse is also at risk for laminitis. So um, the, the, the fundamental causes of what's going wrong in the body are slightly different. One has more to do with being overweight and this insulin resistance that develops as a result and laminitis as a result of that. In the Cushing's horse, the pituitary dysfunction is leading to this cascade of other issues, but they are also sensitive to sugar in the diet, and they are also at risk for laminitis. So um, it can be confusing because the, the initial cause isn't, isn't exactly the same thing, at least as far as we understand right now, but the way you manage them in some cases can be similar, if that makes sense. So I'm going to move on to grain guidelines. Um, so again, same format here, talking about the, the equine metabolic horse, and I have the little footnote here that I would really apply this, and I, that I could have said the same thing on the previous slide. If you have a horse like mine who, knock on wood, does not have equine metabolic syndrome, but he's old type Morgan, you know, can't even look at a grass pasture without gaining 100 pounds, I am managing him as if he's at risk for that condition. So, um, you know, something to keep in mind if you own an easy keeper that doesn't necessarily have this diagnosis yet is a lot of this could really apply for you. For the EMS horse, if possible, you know, for most of them, I'm speaking really generally today, but for most of them, they don't need grain. If you're talking about a horse that tends to be overweight and is, um, you know, prone to that, putting on the crusty neck and some of those unwanted fatty deposits, um, for the most part, they do not need the calories from grain, especially the sugary calories that a lot of a lot of grains provide. So what that means, however, is it's super important to make sure you meet the horse's protein, vitamin, and mineral mineral requirements another way. Okay. So unfortunately, what I see a lot of is, you know, oh, you know, this is this is um, my fat herd. These three horses are overweight. They gain weight on air, so they're out on the dry lot, and they get two flakes a day and nothing else. Um, and the horses are almost starving for nutrition, and I think metabolically that's not helping them at all. Because these horses were trying to get their metabolism back to a normal, healthy place, they, they need vitamins, minerals, and quality amino acids in order for their body systems to, to function properly. So if we starve them of those core basic nutrients, they're not, they're not going to you know, recover from this. So um, the two ways to, to feed these horses are a ration balancer is a great option. Your feed store, your feed rep can absolutely help you find one. All of the major feed brands make them these days, you know, Purina, Neutrina, Triple Crown, Blue Seal, um, you know, your regional feed companies can help you with a ration balancer. It's essentially a fortified grain with as many of the calories as possible pulled out retaining the protein, vitamin, and mineral sources, and it's a pellet, and typically a full serving is going to be about a pound a day, so a pound a day. So the horse is going to feel like he's getting a meal of grain, but um, it's a much more appropriate type of feed stuff than a typical fortified grain for these guys. The other option is that if, you, if your hay is providing quality protein, you could, you could simply do a vitamin mineral supplement. I highly recommend a commercially balanced one that's been formulated for horses specifically. Um, and there are plenty of great options that come in in pellet form. So even if that horse doesn't get any grain, you can still get them to eat the supplement. Um, a lot of that, moving on to the Cushing horses, a lot of that does still apply, but it gets a little bit trickier because in the Cushing's horse, they're not necessarily going to be overweight. In fact, a lot of times as they age and as the disease progresses, they tend to be underweight. Now, not all of them, but it's pretty common. They're losing their muscle tone. They're losing body condition overall. Um, their immune system isn't great. So um, hopefully this horse is being carefully managed with prescription medication if that's appropriate, you know, through the, the guidance of the veterinarian. But from a dietary perspective, there's a lot we can do to, to help him as well. So if the Cushing's horse is losing weight, but has been diagnosed with Cushing's, one of the things you need to try to do is get him calories that don't come from sugars and starches. So here's where, um, you know, uh, one of those sort of low starch, low sugar, low starch type of grains could be appropriate. Um, 
I will say I find a lot of these, not a lot, some of these seeds really do a great job of marketing themselves as, you know, safe starch, like low starch type of a thing. But then when you actually look at the sugar content, it's not that low. So I would advise you to talk to your feed rep and try to find one that's 10% or less non-structural carbohydrates. They will know what that means, okay? And um, the other thing you can look for is um, a little bit more fat in the diet. So fat metabolically is absolutely okay for for this horse. It's the most it's the most dense source of calories. So you pound for pound have to feed less feed if it's higher in fat, and it's not going to have that unwanted blood sugar effect of a really sugary feed that could set the horse at risk for laminitis. Um, some of the other things to look, so, so, so talk to your feed rep if you've got one of these PPID horses who's losing body condition but you know you have to be careful about the sugars because Cushing's does also put him at risk for laminitis. You could talk to your feed rep about a, you know, a 10% or less sugar starch or NSC type of a feed that tends to be a little bit higher in fat. So your typical fortified grain is going to be like maybe 5 or 6% fat. You could go probably upwards of 10, 12% fat as long as you make any feed changes slowly. Um, and that might be a low sugar, higher fat product might be a better option for a horse like this. Okay. Um, you could also, again, think about beet pulp, which is kind of halfway between a forage and a, and a grain, really, so I have it on both sides. Um, rice bran might be a good way to add some additional fat or flaxseed, which is a nice, healthy source of fat, okay? Um, make sure you also understand the difference between a regular fortified grain and a complete feed. A true complete feed um, has a lot of fiber in it, and the serving size gets really large. Moving on to the next slide here, looking at treat guidelines, I just want to say, you know, be careful about treats, choose some low sugar options. These are, you know, not promoting any particular products, but there's plenty of low sugar options available, no added sugar. And then on the next slide here, I, I show you some, this is a, a graph of the sugar content of some feedstuffs. And towards the bottom here, you can see, you know, carrots, when we're talking about treats, carrots can be quite high in sugar, and then in terms of other grains you're feeding, be wary of things like oats and corn, which are also quite high in sugar. Last slide here, the um, second to last slide, excuse me. Um, you know, there are a lot of supplements you could consider for the EMS type of horse. Look for ingredients like um, magnesium and chromium. Are those minerals are particularly important for the EMS horse. There's a lot of herbs in it, um, uh, different there's a family of herbs called adaptogens that are great for the immune system and also great for the metabolism. Um, there's a lot of things here that help manage the sugary component of the diet, help, help support healthy blood sugar, and then also for the Cushing's horse, Chase Berry is really popular, um, supporting their top line with essential amino acids, etc. And then, of course, you know, being really careful about the rest of your management, um, having proactive veterinary care, carefully consider it, considering your exercise program if the horse is, you know, had laminitis in the past. And then my last slide here, um, these are some of the resources that I mentioned, so I'm going to leave that one up for everybody to, to jot down if they're interested. The Equine Endocrinology Group is a fabulous resource for learning the latest information out there about equine metabolic syndrome and about Cushing's disease.